Okay, good morning again. So we're going to just think for a little bit this morning about the question, did Jesus live before he was born? Now, the trouble with having the wrong understanding about something is that if we understand one thing incorrectly, then very quickly it leads to other misunderstandings. And that applies particularly to our understanding of the Bible. If we understand one important item incorrectly, we would have to change the Bible teaching in other areas in order to accommodate the wrong idea. So, if, for example, we believe that Jesus is God, which we know the Bible does not teach, then we automatically have to imagine that Jesus had a life as God before he was born. So our false belief about Jesus being God leads to a further false belief that Jesus lived before he was born. Which is an idea that we often find Christians teaching. So we want to think about that question a little bit this morning. And just think about one or two passages that perhaps by themselves might suggest that Jesus had a life before he was born. And then to understand what they are really teaching us. So let's think about the question in general terms first. Now, recently, we have thought together about Bible teaching about sacrifice. One of the things that we recognize that the Bible teaches us is the importance that Jesus was a man. Not somebody pretending to be a man, but a real man. The Bible teaches us that Jesus was a man. Now, one of the passages we think about in terms of thinking about Jesus' sacrifice and uh, that is Hebrews chapter 2 and in that chapter it really stresses for us the importance that Jesus was truly a man. In verse 14 it says, because the children are flesh and blood. That is, because the children, that is the believers, because the believers are flesh and blood, that is, because the believers are human beings, because the believers are men and women, Jesus also himself likewise shared the same. 
یعنی داریم میگه که اون انس... اونم انسان بوده مرد بوده و اونم همه اینا رو با مرد و زن و ایمان داره دیگه به اشتراک گذاشته The, the writer could have said, because the believers are men and women, Jesus was a man. But he doesn't. He stresses that Jesus was a man four times. He uses a whole series of expressions that we might say are unnecessary to stress the importance of his point. So the Bible tells us that it is really important that Jesus was a man. A special man because he was the son of God. But truly a man. And we understand from our studies in sacrifice that it is only because Jesus is a man that he can be our savior. Because the problem of sin is man's problem, and because the problem of death affects men and women, it was absolutely essential that Jesus should be a man to deal with the problems of men and women. And there are many places in the Bible that teach that truth. So if Jesus was God, he wasn't really a man. He couldn't save us. If Jesus lived before he was born, he was not a man like you and I. Yeah, he wouldn't be the same as us. And we saw when we thought about sacrifice that the importance of the connection between the one who saves and those who are saved through his work. This is why it is so important to believe the right things about what the Bible teaches. If we accept these other ideas that are not in the Bible, that the traditions of the Christian church have added, then we remove the opportunity for forgiveness and salvation. پس اون فرصت بخشیده شدن گناهان و راه نجات اون رو در حقیقت داریم از بین می‌بریم و پاک می‌کنیم. We are believing in something that cannot save. و داریم به یه چیزی ایمان می‌آوریم که نمی‌تونه نجات بده. So our studies in sacrifice از اون تعالیم و تدریسی که داشتیم راجع به قربانی ها teach us why it was necessary for Jesus to be a man. به اون یاد داد که چرا ضروری بود که عیسی مسیح می بایست یک انسان بشه. And if we understand that Jesus was a man, then we know that he cannot have had a life before he was born. Amir didn't have a life before he was born. Yeah. Even Misak didn't have a life before he was born. <laughs> and Jesus Christ is like us. 
That's how he's able to save us. So we understand that it's not possible for Jesus Christ to have had a life before he was born. If he was really a man. Let's just quickly look at Luke chapter 1. Chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Laura Yek, come on. Um, so in Laura Yek, Laura Baba Yek, Loka. Loka. Then we have um, the account of the visit of the angel Gabriel to Mary. And the angel explains to Mary how it is that she can have a child. Even though she was a virgin and had not had a sexual relationship with a man. And the angel explains it will be because God's power, the Holy Spirit, would operate on her. Luke 1 verse 35. That the Holy One who will be born from you will be the Son of God. When we are conceived in our pair, in our mother's womb, then our life begins. We don't have any life before that conception. And that same truth applied to Jesus. The word in the Greek language, that in my English is translated as born, implies a beginning of life. So that the terms that the Bible uses confirm that this was the beginning of life for the Son of God. So Jesus is a man like us. Now then, the other thing we need to think about when we are talking about this topic is the knowledge of God. That God is all-powerful and his knowledge is not limited in the way that ours is. In Romans chapter 4, then the Apostle Paul talks to us about the faith of Abraham. Tells us that our faith has to be like Abraham's faith. And we therefore need to think like Abraham. And in verse 17, Paul tells us some of the things that Abraham believed. So Abraham believed in a God who raises the dead. And a God who can 
accurately speak about future things before they have happened. و خدا خدایی که میتونه به طور دقیق راجع به اتفاقاتی قراره در آینده بیفته پیشگویی کنه و صحبت کنه. So God could talk to Abraham about his son Isaac. و خداوند تونست با ابراهیم راجع به اسحاق پسرش صحبت کنه و بهش وعده داد. 25 years before Isaac was born. در واقع تقریبا 25 سال قبل از اینکه اسحاق به دنیا اومده باشه. God could talk to Abraham about his descendant Jesus Christ. و خداوند با ابراهیم راجع به اون نس و نواده ابراهیم صحبت کرد. 2000 years before Jesus was born. 2000 سال قبل از اینکه حتی عیسی مسیح به دنیا اومده باشه. The knowledge of God also includes things that are still in the future. و اون دانش خداوند در برگیرنده اتفاقات و چیزهایی که در آینده هم هست هستش. یعنی همه رو در بر می‌گیره. And we see that in parts of the Bible that we call prophecy. و این اینا رو خیلی راحت می‌تونید توی یه سری کتاب‌ها که پیشگویی‌ها رو انجام میدن ببینید. that God can talk about future things in advance. In Daniel chapter 2, he laid out the whole history of the kingdoms of men in advance. And there are many prophecies that we can go to where God has spoken either in a grand scale or in detail about things that would happen in the future. And for many of those places, we can look at them and see how God's word has been fulfilled. Even though many years may have come between the time that the prophecy was spoken and their fulfillment. Now we know that Jesus Christ is the most important person in God's purpose. He is the man that God has provided. to achieve his work of salvation. So the whole of the Bible relates to the work of Jesus Christ in one way or another. So We're not surprised to find lots of references to Jesus Christ in the Old Testament before he was born. As God laid out exactly how his purpose would be fulfilled. So the fact that God speaks about Jesus in advance doesn't mean that Jesus was already living. Yeah, this, that's the nature of prophecy. But now let's look at, you know, One passage that people who might have this idea think about. Look at John chapter 17. So Jesus is talking to his disciples and making a prayer for his disciples. and for believers throughout all the years. And he's thinking about his work of salvation. So, let's, um, let's just have a look at some of the verses here. Right? So, verse 1 of chapter 17. پس از این سخنان عیسی به آسمان نگریست و گفت پدر ساعت رسیده است 
پسرت رو جلال ده تا پسرت نیست تو را جلال دهن که داره ایسا رو مسیح میگه اون زمان فرا رسیده در طول این کتاب یوهنا Jesus has said on a number of occasions his hour is not yet. در طول کتاب یوحنا خیلی جایی سرسی میگه که زمانش فرا نرسیده است. But now he says the hour has come. ولی توی الان با به ایراد این توایی یک میگه زمانش فرا رسیده. That is the hour when he will be taken and crucified. و این زمان در همون زمانی که قرار دستگیرش کنم و ببرم مصلوبش کنم. The time when he will be offered as a sacrifice. To achieve God's work of salvation. And he prays that because he has submitted to God's will. That God might give glory to Jesus. And the, the point of God giving glory to Jesus would be that Jesus himself could give glory to God. So he's praying that because of his obedience that will lead to his death that God will raise him from the dead and allow him to glorify God with an immortal body yeah, and that immortal body, that immortal life will be glorious for Jesus but as with the whole of his life, it will all be directed towards giving glory to God. So, look what he says in verse 5. So he says, this glory that I'm asking for, then it's it's God's glory and it's a glory he says that I had with you before the world was and so this really is the strongest verse that we can find in the Bible that people can look at and use to suggest that Jesus had a life before his birth. Yeah. It seems to suggest that Jesus lived before creation. And at that time, he already had glory with God. So we have a verse that, at first sight, appears to contradict what we've been talking about. Yeah. A verse we you know, we've seen that it's essential that Jesus is a man like us, and that if he were not really a man, he couldn't have been our savior. But here is a verse that seems to say that he's not like us. That before creation he lived. And at that time he already had glory. So how do we explain this verse? Well, before we we'll go and look at some other verses and then come back to this place. But the first thing we notice is that Jesus is praying that God will give him God's glory. 
عیسی مسیح داره از خداوند خودش درخواست میکنه که جلال و شکور بشه that the glory that Jesus is concerned about is not his but his father's but in jalal shukur ki dare darkhast mikone mal khodesh nis mal pedar khodesh that he might receive an immortal body to be able to give glory to god shayad yek badan jawidan dashte bashe to betune mon shukur va jalal khoda dare bashe so it's strange that jesus should be praying for that glory shayad ye zara ajeeb be nazar biyad ke isa wasi dare in jalal ro darkhast and saying that it's not his glory it's god's glory if at one time he already had it then it would have been his glory in the past but that's not what jesus is praying for in verse 1 so it's just another reason why we So are suspicious of putting the interpretation on this verse that people do who believe that Jesus lived before he was born and allowing it to contradict what the bible teaches in many places So we want to look at some other verses and then come back to this verse. Come to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Chapter 1 and verse 1. Come to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Chapter 1 and verse 1. So in Ephesians chapter 1 Paul is talking about the blessings that we receive in Jesus Christ. So let's read Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. که ما را در مسیح به هر برکت روحانی در جاهای آسمانی مبارک ساخته است زیرا پیش از آفرینش جهان ما را در وی برگزید تا در حضورش مقدس و بیهی باشیم و در محبت so we have received many blessings if we are a believer in Jesus Christ برکات خیلی زیادی دریافت میکنیم به ما میرسه ما اگر ایماندار باشیم به ایسای مسیح And Paul says, if we're a believer, God chose us before the foundation of the world. So that means then that we were alive before the world began. Yeah. For, for God to choose us before the world began, then we had to be there, yeah? But of course, we know we weren't there before the foundation of the world. Yeah. You know, Paul might not actually be talking about the creation of the world. But he is certainly talking about an event in the past before you and I were born. And he's saying that God chose believers you know, before they were born. و داره میگه که ایس خداوند ایمانداران رو قبل از اینکه به دنیا بیان انتخاب کرده yet we know from our own experience that we had no life before we were born همه ما هم میدونیم که قبل از اینکه ما به دنیا بیاییم مثلا زنده نبودیم so we need to apply the principle of God's knowledge here حالا اون چیزی که نیاز داریم اینه که اون دانش و علم خداوند رو اینجا قرار بدیم his ability to speak about the future before it happens that God knew in advance all the people who would live. And using his knowledge and his wisdom, 
then he knew which ones would become believers. And so in that sense, he chose them before they were born. God's advanced knowledge allowed him to be aware of the people who would be believers in the future. So Paul is saying, God knew about you and I thousands of years before we were born. And designed his purpose for us to have a place. Now the blessing of a place in that purpose comes because of the work of Jesus Christ. So of course God knew about the place of Jesus Christ in his purpose before anything began. Knowing how the history of the world would go. Knowing what would be required for salvation. And the fulfillment of his purpose. He had already thought about the central place that Jesus Christ would have in his purpose. In order to allow that purpose to be achieved. And he has even thought about the place that you and I would have in his purpose. That would be possible because of the work of Jesus Christ. So God had chosen us many years before we were born. That doesn't mean that we were there when he made that choice. And if that's true for the way that he speaks about us, it's true for the way he speaks about Jesus Christ. Let's have a look at a verse in the book of Revelation. Uh, chapter 13. So this is talking about the difference between people who believe and people who do not. And the way in which those who are not true followers of Jesus Christ will follow worldly powers, the powers of men's kingdom. But those who are believers will follow the Lamb. And the Lamb is the main way in which the book of Revelation refers to Jesus Christ. Look at Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. همه ساکنان زمین از وحش را خواهند پرسید اما همه آن کسان که نامشان در آن دفتر حیات نیومده که از آن بره بست که به از بد و آفرینش جهان زهب شده بود so people that follow, you know, a power, کسانی که یک قدرت وحشیانه رو دنبال کنند و ایماندار نیستند and their names are not written in the book of life نامشون در کتاب در دفتر حیات نیمده 
That's a, a figure of speech. Yeah, for the names of the people who God knows will be in his kingdom. And it's described as the book of life of the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. So it's the book of life associated with the Lamb which is a, a name that highlights um, the fact that Jesus is the sacrifice for our sins. So the opportunity to be in God's kingdom comes because of faith in the saving work of Jesus Christ. فرصت جایگاهی داشتن در پادشاه خداوند به خاطر ایمان داشتن به کارهای عیسی مسیح به وجود میاد واسه ما. And Jesus Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. و بر عیسی مسیح اون بره که از بد و آفرینش جهان ذبح شده. So that's similar language to Ephesians chapter 1 and John chapter 17. واقعا یک ادبیات مشابه و شبیه هم که توی مکاشفه باب 13 رو دیدیم همونجوری که توی افسوسیان دیدیم و همونجوری که توی یوحنا باب 11 دیدیم. So Jesus is the lamb because he is the sacrifice that God has provided. و عیسی مسیح اون بره ای که خداوند آماده کرده برای قربانی شدن. When was he offered as a sacrifice? کی به عنوان یک قربانی پیشکش شد و تقدیم شد؟ 2000 years ago. 2000 سال پیش. But was that before the foundation of the world? Jesus wasn't offered before the foundation of the world. Yeah. And there's different worlds there that that Paul uh, that the book might be speaking about. But certainly, you know, Jesus wasn't offered as a sacrifice before he was born. But that, that Jesus was offered as a sacrifice you know, 2,000 years ago after the events that are described in the Gospels. So, did the book of Revelation make a mistake? Did, did the, the writer of this book, who's John, who wrote the Gospel, and who received the vision that he's describing from Jesus himself. Did he get confused and think that Jesus had actually been crucified you know, 2,000 years before he was born? No, of course he didn't. Well, what he's saying is that God knew that the sacrifice of Jesus would be necessary for salvation. Long before it actually happened. So God proceeded to uh, work out his plan with the knowledge that Jesus would be sacrificed at the appropriate time. But because God knew about it from the beginning. He could describe it as being Jesus sacrificed from the foundation of the world. So, 
because the whole of God's plans for the world proceeded with the knowledge of and on the basis of the fact that Jesus Christ would be crucified. Well, there's actually two particular sacrifices that this book could be referring to. There are some of the many sacrifices in the Bible that anticipate the sacrifice of Jesus. So, for example, look at Genesis chapter 3. We know that Genesis chapter 3 is the chapter that talks about the start of sin. And after they had sinned, then Adam and Eve experienced shame and the prompting of their conscience for the first time. And they were ashamed to appear before God. That is to appear before the angels who acted on God's behalf. And they recognized that they were naked. And that they needed a covering. And they tried to make themselves some clothes using leaves. Now there's a very important lesson in this incident. That because of the sin that has changed our minds, that has given us shame and bad thoughts, we need a covering for our sins. And like Adam and Eve, we cannot make a suitable covering for ourselves. We can only gratefully accept the covering that God has provided. And the covering for our sin comes through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So God took away the leaves that Adam and Eve were trying to use to cover themselves. And provided them with a covering made from animal skins. Which in a sense is the first sacrifice in the Bible. That an animal's skin was taken to provide a covering for Adam and Eve. And that provision of a covering pointed forward to the covering that God would provide through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The covering, the provision for sin that would come through the offering of a life. Verse 21 of Genesis 3. So some people suggest that the lamb slain before the foundation of the world the lamb 
که آفرینش به, به وجود بیاد ذبح شده قربانی شده is a reference to Genesis chapter 3 and the provision of these clothes of skin which pointed forward to the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. This wasn't the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But it was an act of God that taught about the need for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That would come at a much later time. But God right here in Genesis chapter 3 was already teaching about the principles upon which he would forgive sins and give life in his kingdom. That would be fulfilled in the sacrifice of Jesus. So this sacrifice is not a sacrifice that took place before creation. There were no sacrifices before creation. But this was a sacrifice at the beginning before the activities of men really began to um, develop. When God was already teaching about the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus wasn't there. But God was teaching about the place that Jesus would hold in his purpose. Okay. Now then, I actually think, that's a common idea, but I actually think that the verse in Revelation is referring to a different sacrifice. The word world can have different meanings in the Bible. Yeah, it can mean the planet Earth that God created in Genesis. But it can also talk about different kinds of worlds. For example, it often in John's writings means the Jewish world. And for the Jews, there was a very important sacrifice that was offered just before the foundation of the Jewish world. And that was the sacrifice of the first Passover. That the Jews, as we remember, were slaves in Egypt. In order to release them from their slavery, God said that he would kill all the firstborn children. But Israel's children could be spared. By the offering of the Passover lamb. And the offering of that sacrifice is associated with Israel's release from their slavery in Egypt. Now, 
Now those events point forward to the work of Jesus Christ. و همه این اتفاقات دوباره اشاره رو به جلوتای داره که گوینده که عیسی مسیح Paul tells us that Jesus Christ is our Passover. Through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven, and we are released from the slavery of sin. We become part of God's people. Just as Israel became God's people shortly after the first Passover sacrifice. So that first Passover set out the principles of the sacrifice of Jesus. It pointed forward to, in a sense, it was a prophecy of the sacrifice of Jesus. It was a sacrifice offered before the foundation of the Jewish world. That pointed forward and spoke about the work of Jesus. Now look what Peter says about it in 1 Peter chapter 1. And we'll start with I.A. Nuzdar. Nuzdar. Verse 19. So... In 1 Peter, then Peter is using the language of Exodus. And comparing the principles of the Exodus with what believers have received in Jesus Christ. Actually, take verse 18 and 19 for a Chapter 1, verse 19 and 18. 18 and 19, yeah. Now, we have a little bit of 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 a little bit from the problem of sin by gold and silver. You cannot buy salvation. But with something much more important. With the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like a pure lamb. And the reference there is back to the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb spoke about the principles that would be achieved in the sacrifice of Jesus. Now read verse 20. حالا آیه 19 هم با بیگ میخونم او پیش از آفرینش جهان انتخاب شد اما در این زمانهای آخر برای شما ظهور کرد و دقیقا دوباره همون جوری که توی مکاشفه باب 13 دیدیم دقیقا یک ادبیات مشابه داره استفاده کنید اینجا but here it doesn't use the term that Jesus was or the lamb was slain before the foundation تنها فرقش اینه که اینجا نمیاد به که عیسی مسیح قبل از آفرینش قربانی شده بوده. But the sacrifice was appointed in advance before the foundation of the world. ولی داره میگه پیش از آفرینش جهان اون قربانی تمام سوز و تمام عیال انتخاب شده بوده. That the sacrifice of the Passover که همون قربانی که توی عید پسخ بوده was a teaching or a sign of what would be necessary. یک تعلیم بوده و یک نشانه بوده که نشون بده چه چیزی ضروری و حیاتیه. 
it indicated that God has appointed a sacrifice that would happen many years later but which would be a sacrifice that provided for the forgiveness of sin. So Jesus' sacrifice um, was before the foundation of the Jewish world that is it was more important than the sacrifices that the Jews offered because those sacrifices taught about the need for the sacrifice of Jesus but could not of themselves provide salvation but the, but the sacrifice of Jesus can and does provide salvation. But that sacrifice indicated that God had appointed a future day in which the sacrifice of his son would be offered. God had appointed in advance. He had spoken in advance about the sacrifice of his son. And in that sense, Jesus was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Because God already had knowledge of that sacrifice, even though it was future. Okay, so... We're running out of time, so bring that back to John chapter 17. So in the same way that God had spoken in advance and appointed in advance about the sacrifice of Jesus, he had also spoken in advance and appointed in advance the glory that Jesus Christ would receive following the resurrection from the dead. So, again, Jesus is not saying that at some time in the past he had lived and experienced glory. But that before the world, the Jewish world began, God had already spoken about the glory that he would give to Jesus Christ in the outworking of his purpose. And in that sense, Jesus had had it before the world began. Not because Jesus had literally had it, or not because Jesus had lived before he was born, because, but because God had spoken about it and had said that that would be so. That the Savior would have great glory that he had been appointed a place of honor 
یک مکانی برای افتخار و عزت انتخاب second only to god himself second only to god himself بعد از خدا دوم شخص خواهد in the outworking of his purpose بر اساس اون برنامه و کارهایی که خدا میخواد انجام So, so we understand that this isn't talking literally about Jesus living before his birth. It's about Jesus expressing his total faith in what God had said. That because God had said that he would glorify Jesus. That Jesus could talk about it as if it was already real. Because he was so confident that God's word would be fulfilled. So we can use these other passages in order to be clear about what Jesus means. To understand there are not just a few verses that contradict the main teaching of the, of the Bible. But that everything that God says agrees together. بلکه چیزهایی که خدا همه کلام خدا هم همشون در موافقت با هم دیگه هستن تا اون حقیقت خدا و کلام حقیق خدا هم رو آشکار کنم به هم و این که ایمان داریم که از طریق همین ما به اون راه نجات دست بیدم اوکی، okay. شکرم و مرسی از اینکه زمان وقتی که ما بذاشیم took me um, more minutes to explain that than I expected. <laughs> I hope that was helpful. So um, we're going to take some questions. And we already have some. But you can um, you can add questions by sending them in by WhatsApp to, to Miss So the first one here, the question I have is we know that the Bible teaches that Jesus was a human. So which verses in the Bible cause other churches to misunderstand and to think that Jesus was God? Um, so I think my answer to that question is there aren't really any verses in the Bible that cause people to misunderstand. The idea that Jesus is God comes from outside the Bible. And from man's ideas and philosophy. And having adopted the idea that Jesus was God, by taking ideas from outside the Bible, then people have suddenly searched desperately for verses to try and prove it. When there aren't any verses that prove it, and to use verses in a way that the Bible does not intend by trying to force ideas into them that people have already accepted from other sources. So, so there aren't really any verses. The misunderstanding comes outside. 
از بخش ها وجود داره همه این ایده ها و نظریات از خارج کتاب مقدس میاد از مقالات کتاب ها متون قدیمی که حالا پیدا میکنن به خارج کتاب مقدس one of the verses that some of you have raised with me a number of times is found in Matthew chapter 28 and what Jesus says about baptizing. Matthew 28 and verse 19, for example. از برایید و همه قرمه را شاگه سازید و ایشان را به نام پدر پسر رو برگو دوست نمی کنید. So there we have a verse that refers to the Father, to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. که داره یه نایر را داریم که داره میگه پدر پسر و رو برگو دوست نمی کنید. Well that, that verse does not teach that Jesus is God. نمی دون جانم این آیه نمی دون متحریم دون که ایسای مسته خدا را دارید. But that's the type of verse that you have to try and force your idea into. بلکه یک آیه ای که شما باید اصل نظرش و اون چیزی که در حقیقت مفهوم آیه رو متوجه شما در کنید. Yeah. That, that, that verse doesn't say anything about God. اینجا نمیده چون که اصلا راجعه خدا بگه صحبت کنید. It says that there are three things involved in God's work of salvation. داره میگه سه تا چیز وجود داره از این که اون راه رفته خدا و هم سریقه بود. God the Father himself. Because salvation is his plan. It comes from him. He has you know, started, originated that work. It involves his son, Jesus Christ. And it involves the activity of God's Holy Spirit power. و همچنین روح القدس که اون قدرت خاص خداوند هستم در درگیرنده این وضعیت هستش. It doesn't actually in that verse tell us anything about which of those three things are God. So, so it's a, it's a, you know, that just shows how weak the idea is. و که دارم نشون میده که اون نظر و ایده چقدر ضعیف و سوسته. So that's the main type of verse that is used to show that Jesus is God. Just you know, keep that verse in your mind and come to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. First Corinthians chapter 8 and Paul tells us what believers are to believe. Verse 6. Verse 6. Okay. So in Farsi, does that verse you sort of about yes, Christ? Okay, so you've got a problem in Farsi with this verse because of the translation. Because in the original Greek language, this verse is very clear. It says to us, believers, there is one God who is the Father. And the New Testament only ever calls God, or only ever calls the Father, God. So when we add this verse to Matthew chapter 28, Matthew 28 speaks about the Father, it speaks about the Son, and it speaks about God's Holy Spirit power. But Paul says only one of those is God. The Father. And in the New Testament, as we say, only ever is the Father called God. Everything comes from him. 
And in the original language, it says there is one Lord Jesus Christ. And the Greek language does not use the term God about Jesus. It's very careful to distinguish between the Father and the Son. It is only it, Jesus is our Lord. But it is only God who is the Father. Yeah. But the, the difference is quite clear in the original writing. That God is the originator, the creator of all things. And we take our place in God's purpose. Through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. But it is only the Father who is God. But unfortunately, you have to be a bit careful with your Farsi version. Because there are a number of places where it use, uses Hodavan about Jesus. Which isn't found in the original writing. So the point is that the idea of Jesus as God is not suggested by any verses. It has to be read into verses, forced into verses, because somebody has already adopted that idea from outside the Bible. Okay, so next question. Yeah. So the question is an interesting question. And it's one that we often struggle with as human beings. Yeah, because we are you know, we are limited, whereas God is not limited. So the question is, does it mean that everything is planned in advance and we cannot make any difference to our own destiny. Yeah. And that's, you know, because God knows in advance what will happen, does it mean that we can't have any control over the outcome? And the answer is that you know, we are beings with free will. God has given us the ability to choose for ourselves. And we know from thinking about Genesis chapter 3 how important that is. That we have to have free will so that our choice to worship God and to trust Him and to love Him is a sincere and genuine one. And so the fact that God knows the choices we will make doesn't change the fact that for us they are real and genuine choices. Yeah, but God knows in advance how we will behave. And whether we will believe his words, 
and on the basis of his advanced knowledge knows who he has chosen for his kingdom so that doesn't change the fact that we still have to respond to his words we still have to make a real choice for ourselves about how we will believe and how we will love and how we will act. Yeah, it's entirely real. And our salvation depends on us genuinely acting in faith. Yeah. And the fact that God knows what choices we will make doesn't change that in any way. The choice for us is very real. So I have a, another question. Yes, um, And it talks about those who don't understand the true teaching of the Bible. It says, because they misunderstand Bible teaching, are they worshipping a wrong religion and with a wrong way of worshipping? And the answer, sadly, is yes. Yeah, and it's a thing of great sadness. That throughout human history, most people have chosen to follow their own ideas instead of what God has taught them. That's what happened in Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve decided to follow the idea of the snake instead of the things that God had taught them. And men and women have been, most men and women certainly have been doing that ever since. Following a different idea to the one that God has taught. So if you believe something that is not true about God, something which is against the teaching of the Bible, Sadly, you are believing in a God of your imagination rather than the real God. So if you believe in a God in three parts, you are believing in a different God to the God of the Bible. And you are directing your worship to something you have imagined or an idea that man has taught you instead of following what God has taught about himself. And God says we must worship only Him. Not a God of our imagination. In the way in which He has taught us. By paying attention to His words. Okay, so that's, I think, the questions for this morning. So thank you very much for listening.
میتینگ و ملاقات و گوش دادیم so we will close now with a Great and loving Lord God in heaven, we come before you and we thank you for explaining your plan and your purpose in your word, the Bible, and allowing us to have the opportunity to read it and to study it and to apply our own minds to the things that you have taught. We thank you for the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and ask that we might develop our understanding to place our faith in him in the way that you have provided so that we might receive the forgiveness of sins and a place in your kingdom. And we pray that the things that we have done together this morning might have helped us to understand and might lead us into a better appreciation of your truth and the motivation to prepare for the coming of your son. Lord God, we know that we have many difficulties and challenges, uh, that this world is full of problems, and we ask that you would be with us and take us through our difficulties and the things that threaten us, uh, so that we might continue to learn of you and to learn to live faithfully before you until the day of thy son's return. We ask that your kingdom will soon come and be established in the earth and that you would give us a place with Jesus Christ in that day. For we come to you in his name. Amen.